네, 여러분 안녕하세요. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you all to the 2021 World Forum for Intangible Cultural Heritage. I will be taking you through this forum, which will take place for three days, and I am Muk so Yun, announcer at NBC Jeonju, and it is a great pleasure to meet you all. This forum is uh, being broadcast live online through the YouTube channels of HCAP, Cultural Heritage Administration of Korea, and Jeonju NBC, as well as the forum's official website. In addition, this forum is being held simultaneously on Metaverse and therefore can be enjoyed on the Metaverse site through the relay screen. We look forward to your active participation. The World Forum for Intangible Cultural Heritage was held under the theme Intangible Cultural Heritage in Cities in 2017, Intangible Cultural Heritage and Peace in 2018, Intangible Cultural Heritage and Civic Life in 2019, and Human Nature and Intangible Cultural Heritage in 2020. And the theme for 2021 this year is a re Rediscovering Intangible Cultural Heritage in the Era of Convergence and Creativity. As we are living in the era of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, we would like to discuss how modern technologies such as AI, big data, and metaverse can combine with intangible cultural heritage to create future value. Furthermore, through this forum, we will shed light on the creativity of ICH as means of cultural diversity and sustainable development and aim to provide a forum for international discourse exploring various cases on this very topic. On the first day of the forum, Irina Bokova, former director general of UNESCO and Peggy Dong, former director of National Museum of Korea will give keynote presentations and the following session consists of presentations from experts from Switzerland, Korea, UK and the US. If you leave questions or comments on the chat window on YouTube or the discussion board of the forum website, we will cover the comments and questions during the panel discussion. I truly hope the forum serves as a venue to have our participants rediscover the value of ICH in the era of convergence and creativity. And with that, let us now commence the opening ceremony of the 2021 World Forum for Intangible Cultural Heritage. First, we would like to invite Director General Yi jong -hee of the National Intangible Heritage Center for her welcoming remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to meet you. My name is Lee jong -hee. I'm the director of the National Intangible Heritage Center. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Irina Bokova, former Director General of UNESCO, Pei Ki Dong, former Director General of the National Museum of Korea, Michael Fisher, VP of Human Relations Files, and all of the presenters and panelists who have agreed to grace this forum with their presence, as well as all the participants joining us on YouTube. Thank you very much. This forum was established as a way for us to have a global network for intangible cultural heritage. And on that basis, search for sustainable ICH safeguarding measures. Thus far, we've had prior forums that focus on cities, peace, civic life, human and nature. And now this year, it is held under the theme of rediscovering ICH in the era of conversions and creativity, befitting what we've done in the prior forums as we have continued to look at resonant and relevant themes. For the past two years, we've seen how the COVID-19 pandemic completely upturned our societies, and we have become used to these virtual meetings as well. It's unfortunate that we still cannot meet in person, but thanks to advancements made in digital and network technologies, we can transcend time and space to have more of these discussions and explore more possibilities and opportunities. Our center is located here in Korea, in the city of Tonju. For the next three days, both here in Tonju and online, we'll be listening to presentations and discussions of over 20 experts from a dozen countries to confirm the challenges that are before us and map out the future of intangible cultural heritage. I hope that these discussions will contribute to more ICH safeguarding policies and ultimately to bring about new life for overall future. I'd also like you to provide more support to the youth summits involving Duong Bik Khan, culture officer of the UNESCO Bangkok office, as well as youth representatives from around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director General Yi Jung Hee of NIHC, for your words. Next will be a congratulatory speech by Kim Hyun Administrator of Cultural Heritage Administration of the Republic 
of Korea. Good day, I am Kim Hyun-mo, Administrator of Cultural Heritage Administration of Korea. I would like to thank all of you for participating in this discussion on the preservation and transmission of intangible cultural heritage. The theme of this year's forum is rediscovering intangible cultural heritage in the era of convergence and creativity. Due to the surge of COVID-19, all fields of society, including safeguarding and transmission of intangible cultural heritage are undergoing considerable changes. In today's forum, I hope to see an exchange of various opinions on how to share and transmit the value of ICH amid these changes to form an international discourse on this very topic. In closing, I would like to thank the efforts of everyone that contribute to making today's event possible despite the COVID-19 situation. Thank you very much. Kim Hyomo, that was the administrator of the Cultural Heritage Administration of Korea. We are holding this forum in a hybrid online forum following last year's forum as well. This year it is held under the theme of rediscovering intangible cultural heritage in the era of conversions and creativity. So we have expanded this in the online through the realm of multiverse and metaverse. And we ask you for your appreciation. Next, we'd like to hear also from the mayor of the city of Tonju. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to meet you. My name is Kim Sun Su. I'm the mayor of the city of Tonju. I'm very curious to see how they would have depicted me as a character in the metaverse. I would like to thank our organizers, Lee Chong Hee, the director of the National Intangible Heritage Center, Kum Gi Hong, director general of UNESCO ICHCAP, for organizing and hosting this conference despite very challenging times. And of course, I would also like to thank Irina Bokova, the former director general of UNESCO, for a keynote presentation, and the other keynote presenter, Pei Ki Dong, Professor Meritas, and the former DG of the National Museum of Korea, as well as our moderators and Professor Ham. Because I am the mayor of uh, the city of Tonju, many people ask me about cities and the role of cities. And when people ask me that, I say that cities are a collective memory. Cities are not just a physical space that is made of roads and buildings and bridges, but in fact, cities are located in the memories of the people. And I think that they are also a bridge that connects our culture to the past and also to the future. In that regard, ICH really is the essence of all cities, because if we don't have ICH, then we do, would have no essence to our cities and our memories would also become fragmented and lost. We have to safeguard and protect our cultural heritage, their practitioners, and also Professor Ham and other researchers who study ICH. I think that they have their work cut out for them. It will be very difficult to do that because it's not as if you are studying ever evolving contemporary music like K-pop, and it's not something that you can look at tangibly. This is something that you have to do with a sense of mission and purpose. So it must be very challenging for you to work in this field indeed which is why the practitioners, the researchers and archivists who are working in the ICH field, I have to say that I completely respect and admire your work. Thank you very much. Through this forum, we can hopefully learn more about how ICH can impact us in a more conversion and creative uh, reality. And I hope that we can learn more from the presenters and panelists. And I hope that this would go beyond just this city and allow for more communication among cities and among countries. Thank you very much to all of our organizers and hosts and congratulations. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor, for your kind words. I would like to express my gratitude once again to all of our distinguished guests for gracing us with their presence at today's opening ceremony, despite their very busy schedules. Next, there will be opening remarks by Kim gi Director General of ICHCAP. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Due to the COVID pandemic, we are still faced with many difficulties. And I uh, would like to say that despite all that, we're here today. And I would like to extend my gratitude to all of our on and offline participants for attending the 2021 World Forum for Intangible Cultural Heritage despite these challenging circumstances. I would also like to express some, my special thanks to all of those that have made today possible. And thanks to your generous uh, time, efforts, and your support and dedication, uh, we were able to host this event. 
and particularly uh, I believe that uh, Chonju City National Intangible Heritage Center and EDGECAP was able to join forces uh, to make today's possible. And with the efforts of all of you, we now have this forum gaining world-renowned prominence in the area of intangible cultural heritage. Thank you so much for all of your efforts. We are at the center of rapid change characterized by AI, big data, and climate crisis. We are seeing major changes in front of us and challenges that come with the change, of course, are not easy. However, responding to such changes offers us with new possibilities as well as uh, opportunities. There is a saying that goes that if you are pressed, uh, you change. And when you change, you find a breakthrough. And when you do find that breakthrough, it lasts. I have faith that uh, the power of humanity's uh, goodwill and uh, collective intelligence that has led us to stay brave, notwithstanding the crisis that penetrated history, to eventually overcome the challenge to open up a new path. Against this backdrop, I would like to re-emphasize the importance of the core values of HCAP, which is information sharing and networking. And I would also like to invite your wisdom and experience in this journey. I hope the 2021 World Forum for Intangible Cultural Heritage serves as an opportunity to, dis to discuss the importance of intangible cultural heritage to mankind in this new era represented by convergence and creativity and to rediscover the value of intangible cultural heritage. Thank you very much. 네, 금기영, 유네스코 아테 무용. Thank you very much. That was Director General Kum Gi Hong of UNESCO ICHCAP. Now we would like to move to watch a short video clip of a performance that I think will well explain the significance and meaning of this forum. The late Lee Me in 2005 used motion capture to capture his dance movements when he was still alive. And this data that captured his dance movements were graphically rendered into a hologram by the NIHC in 2016. And this is being shown together with his daughter.
Irina Bokova, the former director general of UNESCO on creative value of intangible cultural heritage and sustainable development. Hopefully we can have a better understanding of what we can do to allow our ICH to have more sustainable value in our world today. As the director general mentioned, we would like to hear more now the keynote presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants in today's forum, it is a pleasure to be with you here today for the opening of the 2021 World Forum for Intangible Cultural Heritage, organized jointly by the International Information and Networking Center for Intangible Cultural Heritage under the auspices of UNESCO with the support of the Cultural Heritage Administration of the Republic of Korea. Let me share from the very beginning my very fond memories of the 28th November 2011 for the inauguration of the center, which I had the honor to assist personally. Soon, you will be celebrate your 10th anniversary, and you should be proud of your achievements and contribution to better understanding the importance and value of intangible cultural heritage. Now that the Republic of Korea has been elected for a third time as a member of the Intergovernmental Committee for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage for the period of 2020-2024, I'm confident that this purpose will be promoted and widely shared further on. I believe it reflects also the commitment of the Korean people to culture and heritage protection. It is true both for the World Heritage Sites, from the Jongmyo Shrine to the Jeju Volcanic Island and the historic villages of Hanoi in Yangdong. It is equally true for intangible cultural heritage where the Republic of Korea now has already 21 intangible cultural assets, such as the royal ancestral ritual of the Jongmi Shrine and the Gangnung Danoi Festival and Demkyang, traditional wooden architecture, and many, many others. These are precious for the Korean people, but they're also part of the wider heritage of humanity. Intangible cultural heritage is our bridge from the past to the future. It is the way we understand the world and the means by which we shape it. Intangible cultural heritage is the precious possession of communities, groups and individuals. Only they can safeguard it and pass it on to generations to come. This is, I believe, the goal of the Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage, which provides the opportunity to discover living cultural expressions from across the world. But it is also a tool for social cohesion and a way to safeguard practices that are vital for achieving the United Nations Agenda for Sustainable Development 2030. We have come, dear friends, a long way since the adoption of the Convention in 2003. Our starting point is quite clear. Intangible cultural heritage must be compatible with human rights. It should promote mutual respect among communities and it should support human, social, economic 
development and environmental protection. More than 180 states have rallied around these objectives. And I can express my deep satisfaction of the fact that this has been the fastest ratified convention adopted by UNESCO. Robust in meaning, intangible cultural heritage is also vulnerable to the pressures of change. The United Nations Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights, Karima Benun, emphasized already in 2019 the importance of documenting, monitoring, and analysis of risks of holistic impacts of disruption on intangible cultural heritage traditions. This makes safeguarding all the more vital. The stakes are high, so we must set solid foundations now on which to build. I believe this same vision is the inspiration of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which was agreed by the United Nations and for whose adoption UNESCO worked so hard. In the words of its declaration, this is an agenda of the people, by the people, and for the people. For the first time, at the global level, culture, cultural heritage and diversity were recognized as drivers and enablers of inclusive and sustainable development. It reflected the advocacy UNESCO has led with the champion support of member states. And I wish to express special thanks again to the Republic of Korea, which was and still is one of its greatest champions. This is how we can build more tolerant, more inclusive societies. This is how we can learn to live together in ever more diverse societies. This is how we will craft new solutions to eradicate poverty and hunger, to create decent and green jobs in the culture sector, in arts and crafts, in music and tourism. This is how we can overcome the dire consequences of the global COVID-19 pandemic with its devastating impact on communities and people. This is also how we can tackle the challenges of climate change and natural disasters, building on traditional practices and knowledge to protect biodiversity and manage natural resources. Our living heritage holds many answers to the questions we face today. It is our responsibility to defend it. It is our duty to make the most of it. I see the World Forum on Intangible Cultural Heritage as a unique opportunity to share best practices, to strengthen policies, to improve recognition of this heritage at the global level its role in deepening social cohesion, in advancing human dignity and progress. Together, UNESCO and member states have introduced international standards to stimulate and guide efforts. We have increased international cooperation for the exchange of experience and capacity building. We have created tools and lists to demonstrate the diversity of this heritage to mobilize assistance for its safeguarding, to raise awareness about its vulnerability. Most fundamentally, we have helped to change minds. We have shaped a new global understanding of heritage beyond monuments, beyond artifacts, to include living heritage, recognizing it as a force for innovation, social transformation, and sustainable development. I think we should call this what it is. It is groundbreaking. It is revolutionary. Together, we have shaped a radically new approach to the protection of living heritage, putting communities and peoples first, as custodians and as bearers of cultural expressions. Intangible cultural heritage must continue to be practiced and transmitted for humanity 
to create a more peaceful and sustainable future based on dignity and equal respect. The International Information and Networking Center for Intangible Cultural Heritage in the Asia-Pacific region is important in all of these levels. And here I would like to make an emphasis on the new ambition of this information center on education. Because intangible cultural heritage education is essential for understanding our own histories and cultures, as well as those of our neighbors, fostering understanding, empathy, and a better knowledge and understanding of our shared community. Teachers, education managers, heritage practitioners, and the general public now have new resources available in the recent survey report, teaching and learning with and about intangible cultural heritage in Asia and the Pacific. A joint undertaking by UNESCO Bank on Office and the Intangible Cultural Information and Networking Center, the publication presents for the first time a systemic overview of the current state of intangible cultural heritage education in the region, as well as the general issues and trends. The report indeed covers a wide variety of subjects and activities in which teachers integrate ICH, the types of ICH, which are the most popular for using in schools and the most feasible entry points. This impressive publication also details the challenges that teachers face, the support that is currently available to them, and the imperative to make practices more effective. Case studies give a deeper understanding of how, how teaching and learning using ICH is currently taking place, serving as an inspiration for other teachers. And what is very important is that the publication is a part of ongoing efforts to enhance both the safeguarding of the region's ICH uh, and also to achieve quality inclusive education, which is the purpose of the Sustainable Development Agenda Goal Number 4 on inclusive quality education and lifelong learning for all. This is the immense opportunity of leveraging the potential of the intangible cultural heritage to build inclusive, just, sustainable and peaceful world. I wish success to your forum and thank you for your attention. Irina former Director General Irina Bokova, thank you very much for your keynote presentation. Moving on, I would like to invite Peggy Lung, former Director of the National Museum of Korea, and also Professor Emeritus at Hanyang University. The presentation uh, will be elaborating on the meaning of the existence of intangible cultural heritage and its value in the change of the times. Yeah, yeah, Uh, of the forum. I would also like to extend my gratitude to 
technology is all about tangible heritage. However, it's true that we do see a journey or connection between tangible and intangible cultural heritage. So I had great interest in ICH from the very beginning. And I believe that the reason why I was invited to give a keynote presentation is because of my interest in that linkage. In terms of cultural heritage, whether it be intangible or tangible, uh, it may disappear and there are risks uh, that it may disappear. So that's why relevant organizations were trying to find a way to preserve and safeguard such heritage to transmit this to the future generation, and especially for ICH and amid social changes. It's true that uh, it's under the threat of disappearing. So for decades, UNESCO and national governments around the world have put in great efforts to preserve such heritage. The Korean government uh, established I NIHC or National Intangible Heritage Center and also uh, was endorsed to establish ICHCAP in Korea and has been putting in great efforts to find ways to utilize as well as safeguard ICH uh, in Asia and it's been playing a leadership role and in the academia uh, many efforts are being taken as well at the National Folk Museum of Korea, it published a magazine uh, titled Intangible Cultural Heritage, and I know that uh, it was well-renowned in the area of ICH, and I believe that Korea is playing a leadership role in this arena. I believe uh, I will have to advance my slide, so let me do just that. In the digital age, ICH can be a pertinent topic. We also call the digital age uh, the age of globalization. But what we can say is that uh, this technological change is leading to societal change. And because of that, ICH is vastly disappearing in our societies. So technology can be a threat. However, in the area of digitalization, I believe that such technologies can play a pivotal role in preserving and safeguarding ICH. And at these international forums and seminars, we're trying to find ways uh, to utilize ICH by tapping into such high tech uh, and other technological advancements. As was mentioned in my, the beginning of my presentation, intangible and tangible. Uh, it's basically the two faces of one single culture. However, uh, when we see culture of the past uh, transmitting to the present state, uh, the usage or the utilization may vary depending on the times. So particularly when you think about uh, tangible heritage, you can go to the site or to the museums. However, for ICH, uh, it's everywhere. And in the digital age, we can say that it can be utilized in various fronts. So that's uh, one key characteristic of ICH, that it's everywhere. Uh, but uh, the meaning of ICH compared to tangible heritage is that it's closer to the original form of culture. What I mean by this is that if we look at uh, archaeological uh, assets, uh, we do see, let's say, a specific plate uh, or pottery. But if we look at ICH, as you've seen in the video, the dance, every time we see that, the meaning that's portrayed may be different depending on who sees that and how it's performed. And the practitioners and the performers may have different interpretations of their performance every time they do that. So ICH, the cultural meaning it carries and also the advantage that comes from utilizing ICH is greater and more significant in terms of scope and depth than tangible heritage. So then in this age of digitalization, how can we make full use of ICH? I know that this forum in itself is a new format of utilizing digital technologies to share information and ideas. So in the digital age, 
How can we utilize ICH? What would be the desirable way forward? Former Director General of UNESCO, uh, Irina Bokova has given us some very important food for thought of how it can be used in education and also for a sustainable society, how ICH should be utilized. And I would like to go one step forward. I would like to talk about how we can find ways to utilize ICH as a future resource for the next generation. Of course, this in itself uh, is something that we do see underway in national governments as well as in UNESCO and relevant international organizations, but I think that we also need to find the most effective and efficient and desirable way forward. There may be projects and programs in place, but in terms of the methodology, I think that we can enhance the sophistication as well as the efficiency of uh, bettering the process. Intangible heritage has a great advantage that it has diversity and variability. So diversity, of course, we have diverse cultures and archaeological culture is also diverse. But if you look at ICH, diversity is much more significant. Uh, it's deeper. It's uh, way more detailed. So there is uh, a recognized diversity that's out there. And there's also temporal diversity in ICH. During the Rome Empire or Shilla dynasty, when you look at a specific asset, in many cases, you see a fixed image of that asset. But if you look at ICH as it's handed down and as it's transmitted, uh, it's probably portrayed differently depending on when you were looking at it, when it was during your younger years or whether it's right now. So you can see that the display in itself is quite diverse. And the other aspect is variability, variability that it always changes, it's variable. So if we look at the Kayakum Sanjo, the scores of Kayakum Sanjo, Sanjo in itself is one type of culture, but depending on the practitioner, when it's taking place, and depending on the environment, you can see that the overall pro pro performance and the feelings that are rendered are very much different. When we talk about cultural diversity, in many cases, we would think about a big cultural pattern that's in place. When you go to Greece, there's a certain, certain culture. In China and Korea, there are respective cultures. But if we look at, for instance, architecture in Korea, we have uh, the wooden, wooden building technology of Korea. In China, we have brick building technology. In Rome, we have stone masonry technology. So there are these big cultural patterns. But if you look at intangible cultural heritage, there are these detailed patterns or nuances or what I call micro variability. And such micro variability of ICH is a major asset, a major advantage. And we need to find ways to utilize this, to have this and use this as a source for future contents for future generation. So how can we collect and accumulate such diversity and micro variability? And how can we put this to use? This is a, a major theme and a major task at hand. As mentioned, we're living in the age of digital technology. And I've mentioned some of the traits and advantages of ICH that can be harnessed. Uh, but one particular advantage has to do with record keeping or documentation. Digital technology and ICH can be grafted together to raise the accessibility to the mass public. So that's one way to utilize ICH in the age of uh, digitalization. In other words, it can uh, be uh, a, there would be better ways to have the public access ICH by using digital technology. However, if we want to turn this into a future resource, uh, I believe that uh, digital technology can be used for documentation. But if we're not living in the age of digital technology, there are certain records that cannot be kept. 
Think of the past. When you think about uh, recording the dance, uh, there would be specific scores that would be collected and that's how it would be transmitted to the next generation. But right now, what would happen is the action, the audio, the facial expressions, all of this can be collected and it can be recorded and transmitted. And I believe that this is probably the greatest advantage of the age of digital technology for ICH. As mentioned, digital technology can be used to enhance accessibility, and I'm sure that you've experienced this in many fronts. If you go down the streets, you can see uh, presentations of uh, ICH, and here we are utilizing Metaverse uh, to engage in this form. So we'll be seeing a universal use of such technology going forward. But once again, if we want to turn ICH into future resource by using digital technology, there may be more opportunities and more possibilities. For this to be possible, we need to fully understand the digital technology. And we also have to put in place a framework or system to take full advantage of digital technology in converting ICH into a future resource. I believe that uh, relevant governments, uh, the Ministry of Cultures and the centers uh, are engaging in many efforts to uh, realize all this. But if we want this future resource to uh, be made of value for humanity, if we want ICH to be taken full advantage of, we need a worldwide platform where we can gather all of these efforts together on one platform to have mankind use this. So a big data and a cloud system is necessary. So how can we create this? Well, this is a uh, major uh, agenda item. And I believe that this is an area that we need to put further thought into. And it's an area that needs further discussions. There is Google and many portal sites where we store information and use that information afterwards. This is a part of our everyday life. We use this information in that fashion. But what about ICH? We, we want to provide a similar platform for ICH. It's not just about uh, the functional aspects of the platform. It's about utilizing this research as a universal asset or universal heritage. We need a worldwide platform. And this is not uh, for a certain country or for a certain individual or a group or it's just scholars. I believe that this is probably like the air we breathe. It's a platform that is necessary to make sure that ICH can be utilized as a future resource. And I know that uh, the officials of cultural assets, the governments and many industries have to work together to put together a platform. But I want to say that there are many international organizations that will have to join hands to uh, digitize all of the ICH uh, around the world uh, to have it used not only for the present generations, but particularly for the future generations. We need such a system. And there are two prerequisites that have to be met in the process. First is that ICH has patterns, but there are diverse patterns. So how shall we have that embedded onto the platform to make it easier for the future generation to query and find and use. So I believe that the cultural anthropologists and digital uh, technology experts need to come together to see what would be the most desirable data system to enable all that. And another prerequisite that I wanted to mention is in the process of digitization, uh, there is no standardization across the board. In Korea, uh, we are very advanced in digital technology. However, in Africa, there is a digital divide. So how shall we uh, resolve this? In that aspect, we have UNESCO and we have relevant organizations that can play a significant role in closing the gap. We need an international standard and we need to understand how to uh, post this information, how to download this information, and how to use this information. So international discussions would be necessary to do that. And another way would be to also understand how to tap into the resources of advanced nations uh, to build this platform and to have ICH on this platform to make this into a universal future resource. Uh, it's also about having underdeveloped nations to be a part of this journey and to record their ICH. And we will 
have to take a phased approach. This cannot be done overnight. We would need the assistance of UNESCO and relevant organizations to have all of the countries on board. So once again, ICH uh, can play a pivotal role in the future as future resource. And in some sense, uh, it may seem like a very vague and abstract picture right now. But if we think of climate, the climate crisis, and if we look at uh, the many changes in society that we're witnessing right now, in order to resolve these challenges, uh, the solution it lies in culture. And in order to find the right solution, it's about tapping into uh, our past culture and to use that as a source to lead to more creative results and to find these solutions. So once again, it comes from past experience, our culture of the past, and use that as a source to create new solutions. And I believe that this platform can uh, play the role as a bank of ICH. And in the new era of Anthropocene, we can see that in some sense it has its advantages, but the Anthropocene also has to do with dealing with the uh, many problems uh, man-made. So in order to solve all that, as mentioned, what we have to do is to find a way to put in place a platform to in that has great depth and scope and utilize this as a bank uh, to drive solutions for future challenges. So yes, it's true that uh, my talk was quite comprehensive, so I don't know when this all will be realized, but I know that many organizations are uh, trying to grapple with the situation and trying to find a solution. So I hope that we can increase the pace so that before our ICH disappears, it would be great to have a strong platform in place to prepare for the future and also to make sure that it benefits mankind. And I think that it's an ethical obligation on the present generation. Uh, to do just that. So once again, Director General Lee jong -hee and Kim gi -young, thank you for offering this opportunity. And I hope this uh, international forum will continue on in the future uh, and uh, play a pivotal role for future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bay. I think you have given us some food for thought for the future. Thank you very much for that in-depth keynote. With that, we would like to close the opening ceremony of the 2021 World Forum for Intangible Cultural Heritage. This forum was held under cities in 2017, peace in 2018, civic life in 2019, and last year on human nature and ICH. This year, 2021, it is being held under the theme of rediscovering ICH in the era of convergence and creativity. This forum is brought to you by UNESCO ICHCAP, Cultural Heritage Administration, and Honju NBC. You can watch the live broadcast on our YouTube. It is also being broadcast live on the forum's official website. And as you were able to see, we are also providing the streams on the metaverse, on our metaverse through our online broadcast as well. So we invite you to see how it plays out in the metaverse space. And we ask you to continue to stay with us until the very end. With that, we would like to start the sessions in earnest. The first session will be held under the theme of the era of conversions and creativity, challenges of safeguarding ICH. I'd like to invite Ham Han Yi as our moderator. Hello, my name is Ham Han Hee. I am very pleased to see all of our presenters and panelists here. Because of the pandemic, we have to adhere to strict social distancing guidelines, so we cannot meet most of you in person. We are seeing you on our screen online. We are gathered here to enjoy the 2021 World Forum for Intangible Cultural Heritage. We are living in a crisis situation. However, 
I think that even in the midst of crisis, we can still identify possibilities and opportunities. And even now we're seeing this live broadcast being done in an entirely new format called the metaverse. And also we are using the format of Zoom. And through this platform, we are able to meet with presenters and panelists and also our viewers from all around the world. Last year, we also had this forum, 2020 forum, and even then it was held in a hybrid format online with experts from both home and abroad. This year, we have added an extra, extra layer, the virtual world called the metaverse, and we are once again hosting this in a hybrid manner. I think that's quite interesting, and I do hope that for the audience members out there that this could be an ex interesting experience for you as well. The theme for this first session is the age of conversions and creativity, challenges of safeguarding intangible cultural heritage. Conversions, creativity are founded on technologies such as AI and big data, and this is what we're seeing in the era of the fourth industrial revolution. In terms of humankind sustainable development, how and what are the roles that culture and creativity play? That is what we would like to look at in our session. And we'd also try to look at the different challenges that ICH is confronting. We have four presenters in this session. The first presenter is Amy Shelver from South Africa, Lee Suzong from Korea, from the UK, Marilena Alvizidatu, and from France, Marta Severo. We have four presenters who will be joining us in this first session. For our YouTube audiences, I would like to remind you that you can submit your questions through the chat window on Zoom. So after the presentation, so hopefully we'll have a chance to go through that, those questions and go through a Q&A. The first presentation will be given under the theme of the role of culture and creativity for the sustainable development of humankind by Elmi Shelver, the creative economy expert and communications officer at UNCTAD. Let me just briefly introduce our presenter. She is an expert in development issues, creativity, communication, innovation. For 15 years, she has dealt with regional global issues in various fields, the economy, finance, digital, media industries, not just in South Africa, but she has provided consulting services internationally. And currently, she is operating digital channel of UN UNCTAD, and she's also the co-author of the 2018 Creative Economy Report. Please give her a big round of applause. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yes, and we evening to some of our dear colleagues around the world who are um, in the evening. Um, friends, advocates for culture, before we get into my presentation, I'd like to just share a short video on the International Year for the Creative Economy to tee up our uh, conversation for the rest of this panel. Thank you so much. As Professor Bay and Ms. Bakava have already teed up, the world is at a critical juncture right now. 
We need to make and take global decisions that have not been taken since the Second World War. We also need to make good on decisions and agreements that the international community and nations have failed to deliver on to date. These promises include those made after the global financial crisis of 2008-9, the Paris Agreement, the Rio Earth Summit, and several commitments around aid for trade that have simply gone unmet. These failed vows have left the pe people and the planet in peril, and also the most vulnerable increasingly so, as inequality within and between nations rises. We cannot go on like this. That much is clear. And the COVID crisis is just the beginning of several that we will face on a global and human level. I'm calling this the triple emergency of the three C's, COVID-19, climate change, and community and social unrest. I don't want to be dark. We all know what the future will bring, even if we do not want to face it. That's the wonder of working on and in the creative industries. We see things that others and other people do not. There is an upside though. There are three other C's in the arsenal that can help counter the first three. They are culture, creativity, and communication, and we have them in abundance. This is what I'd like to talk to you today about, how to truly use these three tools to generate the step change that is needed to actually achieve sustainable development for humankind. If we are to score the global goals or come anywhere near them, we need to lean on the power of culture to change minds and behavior. And I think Professor Bay alluded to this in his opening address. We need to harness the creativity of all people everywhere to innovate and draw on ancient wisdom, intangible as it is, but irreplaceable. And we need to work hard to improve communications between people, communities, countries, and culture to find better ways of working together to solve what will undoubtedly be global crises. This is no small task. So let us eat the elephant bite by bite. I'd like to talk to you about these three C's and why they are the cornerstone of the choices we must make if we are to embrace sustainable developments on a global scale. To activate the three C's in response, we need to embrace our intangible cultural heritage. And that is why today in this conference is so critical right now. As the climate changes, communities fray, mistrust expands and unrest becomes more common. We need to go back to basics. We must reconnect with our humanity and use the power of culture to embrace the changes we need to make to adopt new and sustainable practices that will ultimately save our civilization. We know that heritage does not stop or start at a museum or some faraway site and that culture has power. We live it, experience it, reshape it, and create it constantly. Our stories, rituals, practices, the daily ones, like taking our children to school, reading books, eating dinner together, or observations like big moments like Hanukkah or Eid or Christmas, are cultural heritage in motion. And we need cultural heritage and the power of its extreme diversity to map out how we will face extreme weather events, welcome new climate refugees to our countries, support caregivers, children and the elderly, change business practices that really need to change if we are to become more sustainable and figure out new rhythms and ways of being or promote intercultural dialogue and be more respectful of other ways of life. These pattern changes are the answer to our future. But in order to implement them, we must turn to the past and draw on the wealth of knowledge and skills that is transmitted through culture from one generation to the next, intangible cultural heritage. 
During the height of the pandemic, artists and people in the creative industries showed us how we do this. Early on in the pandemic, creatives drove solidarity. Starting in March in 2020 with digital fashion shows in Milan, Paris, Shanghai, and Moscow. As the crisis escalated, it moved to empty concert halls and onto apps. Then ultimately onto the couch and into your living room, my living room, creativity in all of its wonder. They say that necessity is the mother of invention. And our artists around the world helped us reinvent new ways of being together apart. They helped us stave off boredom, encourage connection, and kept us entertained during the lockdowns. I remember watching an Andreas Bocelli concert and a West End show online, and then Chris Martin in his living room singing to a global audience. And then watching my South, Africans, South African friends in their band Meraki perform on the roof to neighbors while streaming their home concert. In the process, these creative people and artists were showing us two things. One, creativity makes us human. And two, culture is how we respond in a crisis. The human spirit is indomitable. No more so was this evidence than in our global cohort of artists and creatives singing, dancing, painting, producing, and acting as a balm to the burning pain of isolation. Untad has been tracking the response of the creative industries to COVID-19, but for more than 20 years, we've been mapping the economic value of the creative economy. For many that deal with intangibles, this can seem like an incomplete science. Counting culture, how do you do that? Well, you measure the trade in goods and services. And it is critical that we count culture and track its impact, both commercial and cultural value. So we can influence policy and drive, that drives investments, improve trade and create a better enabling environment so both the social and the economic impacts can be felt by producers, consumers, and communities like us. So what do we know about the creative economy right now? We know that the global GDP contribution pre-COVID was around 3 to 5%, often outperforming more traditional sectors like agriculture. UNESCO is about to release new data which shows the exports of cultural goods doubled in value, from $131 billion in 2005 to reach $271 billion in 2019, which is up $20 billion on the $250 billion figure of 2018. COVID is likely to change these figures for 2020 and 2021, but it doesn't matter. The global creative economy employs about 30 million people worldwide, and it is growing with digital transformation. The creative economy is also a place for young people. 20% of people employed in the creative industries are aged between 15 and 19, more than in any other sectors. UNESCO also notes that women have a more equal hold on creative jobs seizing 45% of creative occupations worldwide. This year is also the International Year of the Creative Economy, as you saw in the opening video, and a critical moment to put create the creative economy issue front and center on the global development agenda. But what is the creative economy? Well, if, if today you read a digital newspaper or bought your broadcasts from a newsstand, if you subscribe to a video streamer or go to your local cinema, if you buy clothes or furniture online or in a mall, read a book or listen to a music streaming service or podcast or an LP at home, you are consuming a creative product or service. Today, the creative economy is intimately bound with the interplay between human creativity, the reason we're here today, and ideas and intellectual property, knowledge, and our great booster technology. The creative industries include everything from architecture to furniture production, computer games to software, art to design. 
as they grow underpinned by rapid technological change, it is important to understand how they are changing and what the impact is. For example, Indonesia reaps the benefits of the orange economy daily. Their latest data shows the creative economy contributes 7.4% to its GDP and employs 14.3% of its total workforce across various sub sectors, from craft to gaming, fashion to furniture. The demand for creative goods, and more specifically, them digitally delivered, has never been greater than right now, and COVID has just accelerated this. So that's the status quo. Now back to the three things. To counter our triple emergency, we can, number one, use culture to drive behavioral change. Number two, harness creativity to create a future that is sustainable. And three, reshape global communications and the media machine to inspire action. So let's look at number one, using culture to drive behavioral change. Heritage is not history. It is very much alive in our daily thoughts, actions, and practices. Intangible cultural heritage is one of the driving forces of the creative industry, and indeed it shapes our perceptions and our behaviors. If we want to combat climate change, we must change our behavior. If we want to build more cohesive communities, as we become more globalized and ironically more polarized in the process, we must change our behavior. Recycling plastic bottles and lobbying for more circular practices requires a new culture of doing so. And cultural programming can do this from theaters to TV shows to sitcoms. Cultural programming has the power to stimulate this change. It's been proven, for example, that the American sitcom Will and Grace helped shift the national needle and reduce homophobia in the USA in the early 2000s. I remember from my own childhood, the impact of theater activations called Love Life and how it shaped my understanding of HIV AIDS and my own personal safe sex practices. Photography can inspire people into action. I was recently moved by student photographers exhibiting on an EU program who documented the plight of the Roma living outside Novi Sad. Film can highlight misunderstood situations. Music can bring people together and generate empathy. The same can, um, the same can be achieved today. Greater Thunberg's school strike for climate is a cultural movement that's grounded in intangible cultural heritage of protecting the environment. But we can get more granular and high impact at the local level by leveraging artists, creatives, activators, innovators, and educators to actively drive change using cultural practices and moments and speak to communities in a language of cultural change that they understand. This is where cultural heritage is so important. Secondly, there is the inherent role of creative thinking and the problem solving mindset that must be embedded in all science, technology and innovation activities for us to tackle the triple C's. I recently saw that Patagonia, the jacket makers, have partnered up with a startup that's recycling old fishing nets to turn it into a fabric for a new line of jackets that they are producing. That's science, technology, innovation, fashion, and a change of business practice all in one, and all of which took creativity to find a sustainable solution to a big global problem, fishing nets. Fishing gear today accounts for roughly 10% of the 12 million tons of plastic that end up in our seas every year. Discarded nets, lines, and ropes make up about 46% of the Great Pacific garbage patch. This is one great example of how creativity can help change that. As traditional industry also goes into decline, trade patterns shift and digital transformation takes hold. The creative industries are likely to play a more central and growing role. Countries that want better prospects for their people should work to leverage their local talent and skills in subsectors of the creative economy to increase their GDP contributions. They can also harness creativity to find new solutions to existing 
challenges under the sustainable development agenda. This means using creative industries as allies to tackle clim the climate crisis, drive a clean industrialization, and innovate through technology. Sustainability is more than just about greener and cleaner industries and buildings. It is also about sustainable growth, development, jobs, and communities. The creative industries can help here too. For example, by intensifying and diversifying in these areas, developing nations, and uh, Professor Bay was mentioning the digital divide in Africa, can potentially escape the commodity dependence trap through new services and products and leverage their intangible cultural heritage to do so. Indonesia, for example, is betting on its tech, game and music industries as turnkey subsectors for GDP growth. Thirdly, reshaping communications to inspire action. We need to tap our oral histories to find new ways of generating breakthrough communications to change people's minds so that we can have the cultural change I spoke about in uh, the first point. Fake news is killing our scientific inquiry and our ability to think clearly. Cultural institutions, creatives, marketers, journalists, musicians, influencers, and artists can play a major role in not only countering fake news, but actually being part of campaigns that inspire us to take action on the three Cs and their impacts. We must reshape the way we communicate and the way information is being relayed so that it drives people to take action and become involved. But for this, we need solid, true, and factual information. We need to counter misinformation and embrace a culture of critical thinking and inquiry. Good communications is not a relic of the past, quite yet. We have a great history and an intangible cultural history to leverage of using communication campaigns to change minds and drive action. The CFC campaign to shrink the ozone layer is but one example of what we can do if we come together collectively as humanity. But in the age of fake news, we can use our heritage, our oral history, and novel cultural ways of communicating to re both reinvigorate scientific rigor while making it palatable and cool to be future-proofing ourselves in the face of crisis. So, in summary, so, so let's think about what you can do. Right now, you may not be able to work. Yes, you do. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I hope you can wrap up soon. Yes, two seconds, thank you. Right now, you may not think you are working to counter the three Cs, but I challenge you to think out of the box about the way you use your work, the, uh, about the way your work uses culture, creativity, and communications to drive sustainable development. You may not be feeling it, but you are doing something. Whether you attend an event, raise money, support an artist, buy a reputable newspaper, support and share good content online, get put on a production, promote great startups pursuing sustainable innovation, you are making a difference. If you encourage others to do the same, the network effects will amplify our mutual and necessary journey to sustainable development. I also ask you to think about what you can do for culture and creativity, drawing on your own intangible cultural heritages and experiences and intensify them so that what is counter becomes mainstream through this wonderful tool that we all have called culture. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Talked about the three C's and this emergency that we are seeing in front of us and how we can also counter them with our own three C's and how we can use the role of culture and creativity for a sustainable development and how communication is particularly important for us to overcome this crisis. I think that was a very informative presentation for all of us and we will see you again in the panel discussion session. Let me now invite our next speaker. Our next speaker will be talking about the fourth industrial revolution, creative industry and intangible cultural heritage. Our next speaker is Lee Su-sung, manager director of Roland Berger's Seoul office. 
Uh, Mr. Li Su-sung is uh, the uh, founding member of uh, the Seoul Office of Roland Berger since 2012, and his consulting ranges from consulting, automobile, manufacturing, energy, shipping and marine, consumer goods, retail, healthcare, as well as investor support. Managing Director Li recently has been focusing on his exp expertise of strategic consulting to offer advice uh, to companies both home and abroad, as well as government agencies on fourth industrial revolution and he was also a part of the completion group for the fourth industrial revolution the future that's already here of roland burger a big round of applause for our next speaker please Yes, so very nice to meet you all. As introduced, I'm Lee Su Sung from Roland Berger. Because I do not have a lot of time, let me go right into my presentation. Today, I would like to focus on how ICH uh, can be crafted with industrialization. So in other words, I want to talk about how ICH can be connected with the fourth industrial revolution, revolution and uh, the creative industries. So let's first talk about industry 4.0 or the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution, we'll have to first think about the technological enablers, which is uh, connectivity. The third industrial revolution was on automation. It, the foundation was automation and fourth industrial revolution is based on connectivity and basically connectivity connects the physical world and the cyber world so physical things and cyber worlds are connected and we call this a cyber physical system and there are also high level connectivity that will enable smart robots, virtual industrialization, big data, and, and I. So all of these technologies of connectivity uh, enables the fourth industrial revolution. So then let's look at the other side of this fourth industrial revolution. When we think about this revolution, we also talk about productivity. It's about enhanced productivity. During the third industrial revolution, uh, it was about cutting costs. In other words, it was all about cost reduction to enhance productivity. But the fourth industrial revolution is about enhancing capital efficiencies. That uh, is uh, the focus of the economic principle of uh, the fourth industrial revolution. It may be a bit too detailed uh, and uh, it may be a bit familiar, unfamiliar for those in the cultural sector. But what I want to say is that if you want to invest in an industry, you have to look into the return on capital employed. And it has to be around 15% plus in order to make that investment decision. During the third industrial revolution, well, we can say that still many industries are living this third revolution and we're in a transitional phase to the fourth. But there were some limitations to the third revolution. And because of that, we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution. So what kind of constraints exist? There were a lot of investments to cut costs. So mass production or standardization were also some ways to reduce the costs and uh, we invested in ways to do that. And that led to too many or too many assets. For instance, Samsung Electronics would build um, production facilities in Vietnam. And the reason why they've moved to these uh, uh, centers is to reduce labor costs. So there was a lot of investments done to cut costs, but with these hefty investments or CapEx investments, costs did go down. However, they ended up with a lot of huge assets on their balance sheets. And with such assets, uh, overall turnover uh, was deteriorated, leading to inefficiencies. So the fourth industrial revolution was about enhancing capital efficiency. And that led to the advent of Industry 4.0, as mentioned. So basically, Industry 4.0 is about enhancing prof profitability, and the x-axis indicating uh, capital employed and reducing such capex investments. So the profitability index and the productivity capital, when you multiply the two, added value will be canceled out and you will end up with the ROCE. So when ROCE is 15% uh, and onwards, 
uh, that's uh, the decision made in investment. So it's about how having to increase ROCE from 15 to let's say 30 percent. So that's the economics here. So it may be a bit too, too complicated, but I want to talk about how this revolution can be crafted with ICH. So moving on to this new industry 4.0 era, what kind of impact would that have on the life of mankind? So basically, in the process of industry 4.0, we can see that uh, there are many areas that are replaced by machine because we have to enhance productivity. Or there could be cases where things that were done manually by human beings will be done along with machines. And the third is uh, with the advent of AI. AI can replace some of the decision-making uh, functions of the human beings. So it's not just about manual labor. Now we can see that AI may be uh, replacing uh, what uh, humans did by using their brain. So we have, it brings us back to square one of uh, what uh, we really want to do as humanity. So then, if we connect the industry 4.0 with the creative industries, uh, what kind of possibilities are out there? Creativity industries is about uh, creating a high value with relatively low capital density. So that's uh, when we take the economic standpoint. Uh, so creative, the creative industries can help us maximize our OCE, in other words, enhance capital efficiency. And the basis of competitiveness for such creative industries is ICH, or in tangible cultural heritage. So in other words, in order to maximize capital efficiencies, we first have to look into selling products and services to maximize profitability. And in order to maximize profitability, uh, we have to think about the investments. And it's about reducing capital, but maximizing profitability. And ca Industry 4.0 will help us do that. By using ICH, we can create content, we can create value, and we can utilize cultural heritage to reduce investments to enhance capital efficiencies. On Netflix, I'm sure that you know the um, very well-known contents that's uh, hitting number one around the world. And I'm sure that you all know of this, um, it, was, it hit the news, it's the Squid Game. So, this is also one example of how competitive Korean contents can be when it's based on ICH. And it also enables us to maximize capital efficiency and maximize profitability. So I believe that this Squid Game example is a very good um, exemplar uh, of how this can be done. So all of these games, uh, in addition to the Squid Game, and there are also all sorts of various plays uh, and games that are done in that content. So this could be a key contents that would create future contents. So the ICH played a pivotal role as a source for future content. So relative to the investments uh, that went in, it has led to great profitability, meaning greater capital efficiency. So the contents that's based on cultural ICH of Korea. The reason why this was well received was because there was a platform called Netflix. This platform, this platform enabled the dissemination of such content around the world. And as mentioned, uh, the platform is a key solution of the fourth industrial revolution based on connectivity. And because we had that platform in place, we were able to utilize our ICH to form and establish new industries. So although this content uh, came and was produced from Korea uh, at relatively less cost and in investments, it was able to create great return and it was very well received around the world to enhance and maximize capital efficiency. So this platform was a key enabler in the process. So then, 
If we want to dominate uh, new industries, uh, such as creative industries in the era of uh, the fourth industrial revolution, re revolution, what should we do? We're already doing a great job, but in the future, if we want to find a way to utilize ICH to create new industries, what should we do? What will be the desirable way forward? Well, first off, I think we need to visualize the path. Uh, for companies, this is called a vision. So many country, many companies will talk about their mission and their vision. And after they visualize what they want to do in the future, you have to act upon this as quickly as possible. And only then can we own the future that we want. So how can we make our ICH into an industry and lead the world? I believe that the very first thing that we can do by using our ICH, uh, we need to first understand or visualize what kind of business models may be possible by utilizing our ICH as our as contents for that industry. So once we visualize the various possible business models, then we have to take action. It could be about attracting investments. It could be also about the government supporting this endeavor uh, to realize um, the vision. And uh, only when we have the stakeholders take action, can we own our future? So with that, let me conclude my presentation. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Managing Director, for that presentation. You talked about how ICH can be utilized in Industry 4.0 to reduce uh, capital employed and to enhance capital efficiency and see more successful creative industries in the future. So thank you very much for that message of hope and I will meet you back during the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Next, we would like to invite our third speaker who will be talking about the age of new technologies, safeguarding and transmitting intangible cultural heritage, Marilena Alivizatu, the honorary lecturer at the University College of London. Let me uh, briefly introduce our speaker to you. Recently, uh, she has published a book called ICH and Participation, where she has argued that for ICH, that cultural heritage theories and policies and concepts and functions that they have served as a framework. She has had a long time interest in this field. She's also been instrumental as a head researcher of I Treasures, which is funded by EU, one of the largest funded projects of its kind by the EU. Please give the researcher a big round of applause. Good morning from London. It is a pleasure to be here with you and thank you very much for inviting me in this year's forum. Thank you also to the technical team for the excellent support. I, today I would like to share some thoughts and experiences of digital and tangible heritage as an experimental interdisciplinary field of community-based research and action. Discussions about intangible heritage are often characterized by what could be described as anxiety of safeguarding in order to avert its loss. Indeed, heritage scholars De Silvia and Harrison have noted that the perception of risk and endangerment is fundamental in the production of heritage value and a motivating factor in heritage practice. Safeguarding anxiety has also been discussed by Professor Hafstein who has argued that intangible heritage appears forever to be on the verge of destruction. Often cited threats include social and biophysical factors, such as globalization, social transformation, climate change, and more recently, the COVID-19 pandemic. Safeguarding anxiety and the actions of governments and institutions to recognize cultural traditions as intangible heritage have been further examined by critical heritage researchers, highlighting nationalistic and market-oriented neoliberal entanglements. The compilation uh, of inventories and lists of intangible heritage through different documentation programs could be regarded as a manifestation of safeguarding anxiety. Yet any process of recording and documentation 
creates a static representation, a moment that captures and freezes in time people and social and cultural practices. It also situates those knowledges and practices firmly in the past. While I'm a supporter of cultural documentation, especially when carried out in inclusive and participatory ways, I believe that the process of defining knowledges and practices as intangible heritage should not be driven by anxiety to preserve the past, but by engaging with the present and looking towards the future. In my earlier work, I examined intangible heritage in relation to the politics of erasure, arguing that impermanence, change and transformation are important heritage values. These ideas can be traced to a philosophical tradition going back to ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus, who famously said, Pandari then many, everything flows, but also in Buddhist philosophy and the Japanese concept of new jo, meaning impermanence, transience and mutability, or the condition of existence which is continually subject to change. Applying such a theoretical framework of impermanence to intangible heritage would suggest a life cycle approach. According to this viewpoint, like everything living, living heritage too, follows a course of birth, growth, change, decline, death or rebirth, and reincarnation. Rather than stasis, intangible heritage is in flux, always becoming. It is within this framework of becoming that I will be looking at intangible heritage and not as static endangered knowledges and practices. Indeed, the forum's subject of convergence and creativity invites us to rethink intangible heritage from the prism of change and transformation rather than the prism of safeguarding anxiety. The rest of the talk will look at how different new and digital technologies can create new types of engagements and find new purposes for intangible heritage by supporting artistic and scientific experimentation and community action. Firstly, I will discuss the iTreasures project, which was funded, which was an EU-funded collaborative research partnership between 13 European universities, research institutes, and small technology startups that took place between 2013 and 2017. The aim of the project was to create an open and extendable online platform, including a virtual learning environment aimed at facilitating learning on a cognitive but also embodied level about different types of intangible heritage expressions, most notably in the field of traditional and contemporary dance, singing and craft. At the heart of the project was a double technological challenge. On the one hand, the use of new technology tools and sensors in order to capture various aspects of intangible heritage expressions, such as body movement and vocal production. On the other hand, the semantic analysis of this data so that they are then made available in a multimodal way through the platform. The platform consisted of separate but interconnected technological functionalities which were the product of the research specialization of partner institutions. Among others, the digital repository, which was a database of recordings, the learning management system courses, which were online courses containing contextual and theoretical information about intangible heritage expressions, and which were co-created by project partners and practitioners. The pedagogical planner, which was a, a, an educational tool for educators supporting learning design and covering different learning situations and target populations. And, fi and finally, the 3D sensory motor learning games, which were interactive virtual learning games. From the outset of the project and as part of the funding call, the research team was required to incorporate the news the use of technological sensors, which were able to capture specific aspects of human activity. This meant that only some types of cultural expressions could be examined in the fields of dance, traditional crafts, and singing practices. A key challenge for the entire project was how to make the platform accessible to a wide range of users. In order to facilitate public engagement, access to the platform became open 
and efforts were made to create strong relations with heritage practitioners, educators and researchers through a series of public events, lectures, training workshops and demonstrations in the different local research settings and virtually. Cases included schools, university departments, local associations, museums and so on. However, decisions as to what exactly should be recorded and transmitted through the available censors put in place a selection process whereby cultural practices became the subject of intensive high-tech data collection and documentation. Often this happened through the use of invasive tools like the custom-made hyper helmet uh, to document the movement of the larynx during polyphonic performances or body sensors for the recording of movement. Data collected through this process were used to create 3D sensory motor learning games. The games were primarily but not exclusively addressed to a younger generation, which is typically thought to be tech savvy and familiar with virtual gaming. While carrying out the project, the consortium debated at length concerns about gamification, including the trivialization, commercialization and decontextualization of cultural knowledges and practices. Yet, project evaluation with groups of teachers and pupils revealed positive attitudes towards the games as resources supporting learning and allowing tech-savvy youth to engage creatively with intangible heritage. Moreover, feedback from heritage practitioners revealed a sense of pride that local traditional practices became the subject of scientific and technological research funded by the European Union. It is now four years since the end of the project, and my skepticism about decontextualization has subsided. What I have come to value out of this digital platform was the co-creation of a scientific experiment, bringing together an international interdisciplinary group of researchers, small technology startups, cultural practitioners, local and virtual communities of school teachers and students of primary, secondary and higher education, to engage creatively and repurpose intangible heritage with respect and inquisitiveness. After all, the project is now finished and all the dances and singing traditions that were the subject of the learning resources continue their own life cycles, regardless of our experiments. A second project I would like to discuss is Art Pluriverse, a community science series on intangible heritage, art and open knowledge and it's aimed to inspire people to experience tradition anew. Although I was not directly involved, I would like to discuss it as an example of creative repurposing of intangible heritage in contemporary art practice. The project was conceptualized by academic researchers at the University of Ioannina in Greece and was inspired by intellectual discussions around the pluriverse, a world where many worlds fit. Based on principles of creative commons like open access and deep respect for communities of cultural practitioners, the project brought together in an online open forum at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, groups of contemporary artists, researchers and local textile communities and the public to enable knowledge exchange, cross fertilization of ideas and creativity. The artist community synergies led to the co-creation of new artworks, often with powerful social messages. For example, uh, the partnership between digital artist Kostandinos Karametis and the Rosario School of Traditional Weaving in Zagori, Northern Greece, which led to the co-creation of new textile pieces that combine traditional techniques and patterns with new media and digital tools. Um, excuse me, six uh, of these online um, collaborations lasted, which lasted about a month, such as artist diaries and the documentation of the creative process are available on the project platform. This is the next project and the final project that I would like to discuss is Palestine Open Maps. This is still work in progress carried out by a cross-disciplinary group of technology researchers, civil society groups, and journalists. 
I think this project is especially relevant to our discussion today because it further demonstrates the possibilities of new technologies to serve community action and memory work. At the center of the project is an online platform that combines new technologies for mapping and storytelling in order to bring to life absent and hidden geographies and stories from Palestine. The project involved the digitization of map sheets drawn by the British Palestine Exploration Fund in the 1940s. These were seamlessly joined up and can be examined together with more recent maps of the area after the conflict. The aim is to further combine these maps with other data sources, such as oral histories from the Palestinian Oral History Archive, village statistics and historic photography. The project team has further organized community events called mapathons with different Palestinian groups around the world in libraries and universities, but also in refugee camps in order to retrieve information from these maps and reconnect new generations with a homeland that they have never been to. During an online workshop, one of the research partners, Majd al Shihabi, spoke about how this model of combining mapping technologies with oral histories and oral history methods can be used in different geopolitical contexts in order to empower marginalized groups. So to summarize, these three projects underline different ways in which new technologies can reanimate and give new meaning to knowledges and practices from the past and the present. Against this backdrop, perhaps now is the time to overcome safeguarding anxiety and repurpose intangible heritage in the era of convergence and creativity, inviting scientific and artistic experimentation, ethically informed collaboration and activism. It is not surprising that all three projects discussed are open access and free to reuse, something that invites us to re-examine debates about cultural ownership and the creative commons. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Alivizatu. She told us uh, about different case examples spanning Europe and Middle East, three cases, in fact, I treasures, art, pluriverse, and the Palestine open maps. These creative projects where new technologies were used to allow us to see the future direction forward for ICH. I think that was a very great in-depth presentation and thank you very much once again. Thank you. Let us now move on to our last speaker of the day. Uh, the next speaker will be talking about challenges and possibilities of intangible a cultural heritage in the era of convergence and creativity. Uh, we have a professor of the Department of Information and Communication at University of Paris, Mantara, France, Marte Severo. Professor Marta Severo's research focuses on action and research in social sciences through web-based data, and her research activities focuses on two thematic areas, which is the collaborative construction of cultural heritage and memories on the web, and the digital representations of place and space. Recently, she wrote a book on participatory command, and also she was a part of editing and intangible and digital cultural heritage and digital traces and domains. A big round of applause, please, for Professor Severo. Uh, thank you, everyone. I would like to thank you, the organizers, for this invitation. And so my talk is really related to the previous one. Uh, I will also speak on the impact of new technologies. And especially, I will focus on uh, inventory buildings and the approach of institutions of using new technology in this area. So I will I organize my talk in three times before I will Quick, uh, quickly introduce the context, uh, the, um, the challenge of new technology in building ICH inventories. Then I will present three case studies, different from the previous one of Marilena. And finally, I will analyze this case study on um, focusing on the documentary uh, aspect of the inventories. So, my okay um 
in my view, we have, uh, as also uh, previous speaker presented, we have a really a documentary paradox. On one side, um, ACH inventories are documents. I think that's interesting to recall the definition of document, the most famous one of Susan Brie. Document is any concrete symbolic indication preserved or recorded for constructing or proving a phenomenon. So document is an evidence, is meant to fix something. Um, the very famous example provided by Susan Briez, the example of antelope, that um, when you see in the, in the natural environment, it's just an animal, but when you take, take it and you put in a zoo, it becomes an evidence of the species. So it's fixed in the time. On the other side, uh, ACH uh, this, um, is really, the, the challenge of his age, as we told, is to um, keep the relation with the community and to not fix it, to safeguard it in uh, its changeable nature. Now, also UNESCO tried to find solution, no? just to recall another no? register of, of good practice is a way to uh, try to safeguard the, the practice of guardian and not just objects. So, to, to uh, keep this changeable nature. And we can also, I put this screen catcher also to show you know, that in, in when you have an application to UNESCO, you have to buy videos and photos. So um, material that should help to keep this uh, changeable nature. So I will focus on the impact of new technology, a specific type of new te technologies that are social web. And uh, it's important to recall because today when we think on social media, we think uh, to the GAFA, to um, the threat of the social media. But uh, in the very nature of social media, we have participatory culture as Marilena, in the example of Marilena, we saw is the, the bottom nature, the possible of interact, of the empowerment of community. Um, there was, um, uh, it's important to also recall the work of uh, the scholar Shen and Pietro Bruno that a few years ago studied the, the um, communication on social media related to the item of Melevi ceremony and show how YouTube can provide different um, example of the practice different from the application that you have in YouTube because you can have video where women um, are present or where you have colorful dresses and um, so uh, it, uh, this example show the creative possibility that open a new technology in the field of building uh, um, inventories. So I will focus on three examples. Uh, three examples that are related to institutions, to national institutions, because it's important to keep in mind that national inventories is a, a task of the state. The first example is quite peculiar because the example of Scotland, Scotland are, uh, um, is important to underline that uh, cannot uh, sign um, the convention. Anyway, it was the first example of participatory inventory of living heritage. In the first uh, form, it was created by uh, some scholar of the University, the McClary of the University of Edinburgh, Napier on um, the demand of the Museum Gallery Scotland. At the form was a media wiki, a very open media wiki, where um, everyone could um, add a file concerning a practice. Uh, there was no necessary to create an account. Few years later, uh, the Museum Gallery Scotland decided to change the form and we have a Drupal website, a more structured website that is still open to contribution, but you have to ask for an account. You can uh, you cannot create categories, but you have to keep um, to be coherent with the structure already established by the institution. So you see there are some like say contradiction between the openness of a wiki and the contrain that the institution has to set. 
The second example is the same example of uh, the excellent example of Finland, where um, uh, the National Council of Antiquities provides uh, several tools that support bottom-up inventories from at the national level. The first one is this wiki inventory. The tool is the same, is a media wiki. In this case, you need to register to, um, up, to write a file or to contribute to an existing file but uh, registration is open to everyone. Anyway, it's important to underline that there is another tool. There are the small, the circle, small circle of people related to specific ACH categories. And this circle are really the circle that define the official file that is in, um, inscribed on the national inventor. So also this time you have two tools. You have the wiki that is very open, but there is also an institutional form and the interaction between the two is not really um, transparent anyway. Not all files uh, become um, files in the national impact. The third one is the example of France. In France, in 2016, a, a new website, a new platform of HCH was published, is the PCA Lab platform. This platform published the official files of the defined by the Ministry of Culture. At the same time, this platform is based on, so on semantic web, and so information um, are also connected to Wikidata in order to um, have an uh, interactive research in multi-language. So to do this, all files of the national inventory are also present on the Wikipedia um, uh, form of the French edition of Wikipedia. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, so at the end you have a three way of uh, publishing a ACH uh, file. The first one is the PDF on the official website of the ministry, but it's not so interactive, so uh, interesting to, to, um, for the accessibility. Uh, we, uh, we saw uh, previously in previous talk, accessibility is key point. The second um, is the PCA Lab, so a more interactive platform. Uh, to access to ECH, and the third one is this file on Wikipedia. But what is happening? We don't have the same content. Actually, with the files on Wikipedia, I took the example of WOCA that was inscribed on the UNESCO list in 2014. Uh, the file in Wikipedia existed before the inscription on UNESCO and on the National Inventory and uh, contains different content. For example, if we take the national file of the French inventory for Quokka, um, the content is more focused more on the transmission of the practice. And if we take on the Wikipedia page, it focuses more on the performance of the core um, and on some controversies about the style of music. So what is happening in Wikipedia? In Wikipedia, we have different actors, different kinds of contributors. We have the SEH professional of the Minister of Culture that published the files in order to fill the official website related to Wikidata. But we have also the Wikipedia administrator. We have some technician of Wikipedia that correct the grammar and so on. And we have a lot of amateurs that can intervene on very different kinds of subjects. They, today they work on ACH files, tomorrow they work on um, writers, the day after they work on uh, games pages and so on. Finally, we have a few people that are really interested in specific practice, for example, Walker, and they intervene on specific page with a, a very important expertise. So if we take, for example, this is uh, um, this slide represents the evolution of the content of the page of Quokka uh, through time. The page was created in 2006 and is still ongoing. And you see that uh, the content grew up importantly after the inscription in 2014. So if in 2014 the official file is fixed in some way, 
the file, the, the page on Wikipedia evolves in the year after. So oh, my problem is um, uh, that these three examples show there is kind of ambiguities and controversies in opening up and render is true um, new technologies and not I mean, bottom-up technologies like Wikipedia that uh, allow to create shared knowledge but also make it possible to define the limits of intervention by communities. In, uh, so at this point, it is interesting to um, tr try to understand which is the normative power of this kind of inventory, which is the relation between this inventory uh, and in the official inventories, uh, which is uh, if there are the official inventory, um, how they can really accompany the definition in, uh, of ACH in a flexible way. So to answer this question, it's important for me to come back to the definition of document. And I will use the definition of document provided by an Italian philosopher, Paul Maurizio Ferraris, that proposed this uh, documentary pyramid. Uh, according to the, his definitions, it's important to distinguish trace and document. Anyways, it defines four levels of and document type of document. The trace is just when you have the event, something is happening with no, no intention and no registration. Then to go up to a document, we have the registration when the trace is kept in a kind of support. So for example, don't there is social media that keep a trace of our of uh, our action. Then th that is not enough to speak about the document because we need also an intention. When we have an intention to share this registration, we have an inscription, we have a social fact. So we have something that has a social value, but it's not enough. We, according to Maurizio Ferrari, we speak document when we have an institutionalization of the trace. We have a fixation of the trace. So according to this first definition, um, what we have on the wiki is not really a document, so is not comparable to uh, an inventory and that we don't have an institutionalization. Sorry. But what is interesting is that, uh, according to this philosopher, new technologies makes necessary to distinguish today two type of document. It's not so easy as in the before, uh, uh, just when we have written document. He distinguished uh, weak documents and strong documents. Both have social value, but uh, strong documents as the one that have normative, normative institutional value, and weak documents are the one that have just social value, but are also important. So my point is that the interest of this uh, type of tool, this creative solution of using um, new technologies, is uh, exactly the ambiguity at the um, of the solution. The fact that don't define uh, specifically uh, what is normative and not. In any, in my view, they are an excellent um, implementation of the spirit of the convention of what uh, Clara Bortolot called the informality of the implementation of the convention. We need this space of informality to make it work, uh, to make, uh, we need this space of cre creativity uh, in using new technology in order to keep a registration flexible that uh, respect uh, the living nature of intangible cultural action. Thank you. I finished. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Severo, for your presentation. You've mentioned about the importance of uh, inventorying. It's a key safeguarding practice for ICH, as mentioned but you've mentioned about the cases of Scotland, Finland, and France of how uh, certain documentation is being done by utilizing digital technology. And you've talked about some of the challenges uh, that we need to take into account when we do want to uh, put in place uh, or document or engage in inventorying of ICH. And I believe that the countries that are uh, trying to put in place an inventory of ICH, your research efforts will uh, be of great benefit. So thank you very much. Thank you.
So I would like to thank all of our panelists, the presenters, and we do would like to bring them back so that we would like to take some questions from the floor and engage in a discussion session with them. I do believe we have some questions. We have collected some questions from the online audiences. Let me first go through the question that we received on our YouTube channel, and this is going to Amy Shelver of Ontad. The questioner is from Sim Jun Hulse. And for uh, you've mentioned the importance of oral history and how it is linked with communication. Can you share us with more cases of oral history being used in uh, communication? And our second question is also for Michelle Ver. In the digital era, you've mentioned there are many different challenges, such as the spread of fake news. So we need to hone our critical thinking skills to overcome that. But how can cultural heritage help us to hone our critical thinking skills? Can you give us some uh, case examples? This is something that we received from our YouTube channel as well. And with regard to uh, Mr. Lee Su Sung's presentation, the question is, uh, that came in is the following. Uh, this is a, a question that was posed in English. So let me uh, change my spectacles to uh, read the questions. If uh, and I ask for your understanding, please bear with me for just a moment. So uh, the question for Mr. Uh, Yisoo Song. Experiences, what sort of industries can be fostered in developing, least developed, and the developed countries' issues based on based on ICH and how? So I can see that uh, this question has to do with how the developing states or underdeveloped states uh, find ways to craft ICH with uh, uh, industries or to develop new industries with ICH. Yes, so we have uh, received a total of three questions via YouTube. And uh, I would like to ask the respective speakers to respond if possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm, I'm going to respond, I think, collectively, because the, the questions that were raised, I, I think, collide in, in, um, in the case of Simjun's question, and also the question about um, the digital era and creative thinking. So, uh, sorry, critical thinking. Um, Probably one of the best cases that I can provide actually comes from, from South Africa amid a deep crisis that we were experiencing uh, between through the 90s and early 2000s and in fact all the way up to 2010 in the form of the HIV AIDS crisis where there was a lot of fake news going around um, that emanated from communities about how you contracted HIV. Um, and how it was passed and where it was coming from scientifically. Um, and in this case, a campaign to change people's minds and behaviors, drawing on oral history, case studies from, from people's history about how disease is transmitted and then adapted to the HIV messaging actually helped people not follow the, the fake news that, or the, the, the um, the wrong information that HIV was being spread by small planes or um, by doctors themselves to help people understand that actually this was a disease and it was framed in the in, in the in the way of um, looking at other pandemics and other big crises that 
these communities had faced in the past. And so using that oral history, it, uh, the message was able to be transformed from something that was negative or wrong into, into something that was positive. And this is just one case study of how by tapping into existing stories that, um, and histories and uh, previous crises and experience of, the, of these events, people can, can leverage oral history and now in the in the digital area also um, apply critical thinking or draw on their own histories to understand what is happening to us. And that is the key thing with all culture is that with culture we make sense of our existence and we can it can be used uh, in a dark way and it can be used in a light way and that and that takes people with a cultural presence of mind to understand exactly what what the essence and the truth of it is and then to transmit that truth uh, accurately to the people that are listening i hope that answered your question and gave you a good enough concrete example of of uh, oral history in, in play in communications and in behavior change. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your response. So you've mentioned about uh, HIV AIDS in South Africa and all about how fake news uh, had an impact through the oral culture of the past that has enabled an accurate communication of um, facts based on science. So thank you very much for that response. And next, uh, Managing Director Lee Su-sung, would you like to respond? Um, yes. So let me clarify the question once again. Let me see if I understood the question. So for underdeveloped states and for developing nations, how can these countries uh, utilize ICH to create new industries? Uh, so that is, uh, I believe that is the correct understanding of the question. So having said that, in order to build businesses uh, or industries, there are certain requirements that have to be met. For instance, in the case of contents, and well, ICH uh, includes some, well, many things, but it could be food culture, it could be contents, it can actually branch out to many areas. But for this to be commercialized or to make this into an industry, you need a foundation. So, particularly the cultural industries that we see right now do have a strong industrial base um, and like in the many cases of advanced nations and let's look take the case of Korea in the 80s and 90s and now we're now in Korea we're a cultural power but because we had that industrial basis in place in the 80s and 90s we are now able to enjoy the benefits of this uh, very strong base but as mentioned, that wasn't the case in the past when we did not have that foundation. So then for the underdeveloped and developing nations, what can be done is, as was mentioned by the panelists, so you can see that you're trying to archive and inventory the ICH and engage in safeguarding practices. So the first thing that you can do uh, is to have, well, some of the advanced nations utilize their contents by, util, uh, by uh, taking advantage of the industrial foundation that they already have. So when I talk about industrialization of ICH, you need a domestic market or you need a domestic industrial base to uh, have that take off. But with countries with a less sophisticated sophistic, uh, less sophisticated industrial base. If you do have a strong contents industry already, then it wouldn't be much an issue. But if you do not have a strong domestic industry base in the country, in most cases, it's very difficult and challenging to actually uh, turn these ICH into an industry right away. But as mentioned, it's all about a platform. So you can utilize the platform of other countries as an initial attempt. In the case of Netflix, 
Uh, they invest it uh, in the relevant local markets and uh, they're curating contents that caters to the needs of the local market. So this could be one way to industrialize ICH. So what I want to say is that if you do not have a strong industrial base domestically, it may be a bit difficult and challenging to actually uh, make ICH into an industry right away. Yes, thank you. I truly uh, hope uh, that that answered the question. And I think that there is another question for Professor Marilina. I'll leave it that too. This is a question from Dima. Could you share us with some information regarding your information management system? I think that it will be useful to us all to hear about your information management system. I think in the interest of time, perhaps you might not have enough time to go into the details, but if you can share us with some more details about the information management system, uh, like the ones that you've been putting into use in the PCI in France, if you can tell us about how the information was managed, what kind of system you use there, please? Yes. And there have been many public there have been many publications written around the technology involved in putting together this project. Obviously, there were many different technological platforms that we used. The main platform of the iTreasures was a Drupal platform. And on that, they combined and interconnected it with different other uh, platforms which were developed in each research partner. I, I can send you further details uh, about the technology. I was more involved in the social aspect and community work and building those partnerships with the local people through the training and further demonstration activities. Uh, but there are many publications uh, which you can find and are available online, including a recent paper I wrote. If I may able to add two things on the oral history question, though, which is um, a very interesting area of work for me, and I think needs to be further combined and brought closer together with work on intangible heritage. And in my recent book, I, re I wrote about two specific cases of oral history work and how they can be used in museum and heritage work through um, also new technologies, but in the context of museology which was uh, based at the Museum of London, the one with working with refugees and combating those stereotypical representations through oral history carried out by refugee communities and presented within the context of museums. And the second one, which again, further details are also available online, is another case from Peru, the Luar de la Memoria, which is an entire museum built around oral history te testimony and personal kind of engagements with the conflict of Peru and how this has helped reshape uh, visions about the future, but also come to terms with a, with a traumatic and very difficult past and how oral history and reviving those skills and knowledges has helped towards reconciliation and perhaps going back to the South African cases. Uh, so oral history is a very powerful tool and I think we need to be working more in, in that area. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, we do have some more questions uh, for uh, Ms. Amy Shelver. There's another question. Thank you very much for your very insightful presentation to uh, Ms. Shelver. And the question goes, what can we do to make ICH more attractive to younger generations to help them continue to safeguard ICH? So what can we do to make ICH more attractive to younger people? If I may, this is probably where that third tier, the communications focus in, the, in our tools and our arsenal is that critical because currently marketing campaigns, communications campaigns are what generates a sense of coolness or accessibility. And our creative people, our artists that are working at the ground level on these topics are the people that are generating campaigns for big design companies, for marketing and advertising companies. And so I think really if we can harness the creativity inherent in um, the young people that are delivering digital content and digital marketing and get them, convince them to focus on intangible cultural heritage and its elements, that is will be a turnkey in the way that cultural um, intangible cultural heritage 
is perceived. Because right now, our issue is always making the intangible tangible and meaningful to people. And there are incredible ways that we can do this. I, and, and maybe to come back, back down to the oral history example, we are speaking more than ever before. We are documenting ourselves. Uh, this conference is an exact, uh, an exemplar of of, an approach, of new approaches to digitalization and speaking and recording history as um, the previous panelists have uh, mentioned. And so truly it is about packaging, communicating more clearly and focusing and encouraging young people and marketers to focus on the topic of intangible cultural heritage. And there is, I think the Netflix example is, is also a very good one, um, Mr. Susan, Mr. Lee, because yes, it is taking local content and projecting it back to local audiences and content there, intangible cultural heritage, the stories that make up our practices and our behaviors come from people. And if they're reflected back at us, it does make it more accessible. This obviously requires campaigns, it requires investments, it requires policy, it requires government, NGO, and uh, the creative industries themselves to recognize the intangible, the value in intangible cultural heritage. And so it is on all of us to pick up the baton and look at this, uh, look at this as a key and important factor in transmitting not only our past histories, but our yeah. current histories as they evolve. Thank you. 네, 네, yes, thank you very much for that response. And uh, Professor Marta Severo, you also have a question. So, uh, the, so they thanked you, uh, thanked you for your wonderful presentation. And also, uh, it's that for underdeveloped nations, uh, developed or developing countries, they haven't been able to inventory, engage in any inventorying uh, of their ICH. And there are also cases where they don't have it, many inscriptions to the UNESCO list. So can you maybe help them out? Any advice that you would like to offer to these countries that weren't able to engage in any inventorying of their assets or heritage? Yes, thank you for the question. I think uh, that the example that um, I provide showed that uh, um, low tech solutions are a very key point today. Uh, we, we can have big projects like iTreasure that uh, are useful to find a new solution, but for everyday inventory, we can really work with very low tech like Media Week, but also more basic. The solution, the, the main point is to combine, I didn't have the time, but is to combine face-to-face -face activity to online activity. All uh, these examples I provide, there are, um, there are focus group, there are uh, Workshop that are organized with people on field work to produce content for the wiki. So this is my um, my my recommendation is to uh, don't focus on big portal uh, in underdeveloped countries, but uh, think of basic solution to connect face to face activities. Thank you very much. We have yet another question on the CHA channel and also through the ICHCAP Center. It's in the Korean language. Thank you to all of our presenters and the panelists, especially for the case studies. They were helpful. When we continue to preserve ICH going forward, I believe that it's very important for countries to engage together internationally. So what can countries do internationally to better preserve ICH elements? This is a common question to the presenters. It's not designating one person in particular. So maybe each of you can go around and give us your thoughts. What should countries do? What should international society do to try to preserve these various ICH elements? Can you let us know? Uh, 
부분부터 하실까요? Uh, who would like to go first? Maybe we will go in order of the presentation. So Dr. Shelver, or maybe we would go in reverse order. Uh, Professor Severo, would you like to go first? Uh, it's a very huge question, <laughs> so I think the only answer we can say is a great to have this initiative like this forum where we can uh, share experience and work together. I think for uh, software ACH international level, we need this. We need a forum for exchange experience. Is uh, uh, really. Uh, find common solution and learn from mistake of others. I don't have a specific uh, solution, but uh, this is just my talk on this point. Thank you very much. We would need grand goals, but also these small seminars and discussions and forums would be helpful for us to try to each of us look for different solutions and share them among ourselves. Next, we would like to hear from Professor Alivizatu. Uh, thank you very much for the question and uh, from personal experience and having engaged in different international fora around the world, I think that uh, the international community is very active in the field of intangible heritage through the convention and through the different mechanisms uh, driven by UNESCO. Uh, the work so internationally and especially with conferences and the international dialogue is quite active. What I think we would like, and I think uh, I'm taking on from where, where Marta left, is the, the discussions on the ground and seeing what happens, you know, at what the community, at the level of communities and grassroots research, what is happening at that level and bring that into perspective and learn from each other, but starting from the bottom up and having these, uh, these international discussions. Every country is different uh, and faces different issues, different challenges, whether they are, you know, as you said, the the digital divide. Uh, so by having for, for us such as this and exchanging ideas and dialogues, we also learn from each other, but also adapt to local situations. So uh, my opinion is that already there is a lot happening internationally and at the higher level of UNESCO, but we should be learning more about challenges and opportunities that are raised uh, on the ground. I hope that makes sense yeah. and that covers the question. Yeah. Thank you very much for the response. Uh, Mr. Lee, would you like to add? Uh, efforts to safeguard and preserve ICH and identify ICH is not something that can be done by a single person or a single party. I believe that all stakeholders need to engage in joint efforts. And in other words, we need consolidated efforts. Uh, in order to reap fruit. Well, personally, well, my presentation, the topic was how to uh, turn ICH into an industry. Uh, in the process of identifying ICH and to safeguard ICH, uh, well, you first need investments to do all that. And I can say that these investments are not just one off. They are what happens is so with the investments we can identify and safeguard ICH and once we do that it also continues on to create new value so there is this virtuous cycle which induces new investments creating another set of new values so there is this virtual cycle that can uh, that can will come to play so of course we do have public agencies or governments that need to push from behind and support but the industries also have to engage in pull. There's a pulling effect uh, that also has to be uh, in place. So you've mentioned uh, that uh, with uh, developed nations and developing nations, uh, they would have to cooperate. And based on your comments, I can once again re-emphasize uh, the importance of cooperation across the board amongst all uh, countries. Now, we would like to hear from Ms. Shelver, and with that, we would like to conclude. 
I think my colleagues have covered everything and I tend to agree with Mr. Uh, Professor Lee that and we need to engage communities and the critical part of my presentation was that we have three powerful C's in our arsenal. We have culture, we have creativity and we have communication and these three important intangible things in and of themselves can be a driving force for, for change, for awareness and for maximizing intangible cultural heritage. We uh, regret that we did not have enough time for the discussion, oh, but due to time limits, I'm afraid that we have to close here our discussion session. I would like to thank our, our four panelists, um, Amy Shelver, Lee Su Sung, Mary Lena Libizatu, and Marta Severo, our panelists, thank you very much for your time and your presence here with us today. And of course, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all of our audience, uh, online audiences who are joining us through various different channels, both on YouTube and our official website, who have submitted their questions and opinions. Thank you to our online audiences. With that, we would like to conclude the first session of the 2021 World Forum for ICH. So we talked about the uh, challenges uh, in ICH in this era of convergence and creativity, and I would like to extend my gratitude to Professor Ham Han Hee and all panelists for their insightful contributions. And this concludes all sessions of the first day of 2021 World Forum for Intangible Cultural Heritage. Uh, tomorrow, starting from 2 p.m., September 30th, the second session will take place, and the second session will be under the theme Possibility of Innovation and Value Creation Found in Intangible Cultural Heritage. Uh, we would like to ask you to join us tomorrow as well. And once again, thank you very much for attending. And with that, let me conclude day one. Thank you. Thank you.